My name's Tim Richards. Uh, I'm the CEO of Geo Pacific, an ASX listed uh, gold producer. We're developing the, the Woodlark project in Milne Bay Province in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the project's recently been uh, finalised the debt and we're now fully funded. Uh, we're under construction and looking to pour gold in, in the December quarter of 2022. Tim, good to see you. How are you? Yeah, thank you. It's so good where, to see you too. Where are you calling from? Where in the world are you? I'm in uh, Brisbane, Brisbane, Queensland, so presently enjoying lockdown. Oh, boy. That's a tough one. Yeah, here's one for you. That's, that's where I was born. That's my hometown. Long time ago. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it's a, it's a bit dire here at the moment. We've uh, been thrashed 2-0 two, two so far in the state of origin. So uh, things are looking fairly grim in Queensland right now. <laughs> okay, well, let's, we're, we're, we're going to talk about um, your business, Geo, Geo Pacific. Um, we, I, we've not met or sp- spoken before, and, and I've not heard this story before. So it'd be great to kind of just dig into the weeds and sort of maybe go back a bit and sort of see where this uh, came from. So if you don't mind, can you give us a little bit of a potted history um, as to when this thing um, started? So the Woodlark project has, I guess, been around since 1895. It was originally you know, one of the original gold fields in Papua New Guinea. Um, you know, historical estimates suggest that up until uh, World War II, almost 250,000 ounces were produced on the island, uh, obviously under pretty, pretty basic conditions. Uh, subsequent to that, it, it passed through a number of hands. It's, it's been drilled on and off by uh, various entities, uh, BHP and the like, over the period. And then Placer Dome had a look at it in the 90s when, when they were operating the Missima mine down on Missima Island, which is, is not too far away. Uh, but I guess in its current iteration, it was in the early 2000s, it was picked up by Cooler Gold, another ASX listed company. Uh, they spent quite a substantial amount of money developing the resource and, and ultimately took it through and, and, and got it permitted in 2014 for, for the mining licence. Uh, and at that point in time, Pula Gold struggled financially. Uh, Geo Pacific stepped in in 2016 and, and through a, a joint venture exploration program, gradually took, con- took control of the company and, and uh, ultimately now Geo Pacific owns the asset 100%. Uh, 2018, Geo Pacific uh, undertook a feasibility study in advance of, of, of developing the project. Uh, and then that was updated uh, late last year when we put out a, a project execution update. Uh, that, that indicated that it was a you know, positive project. And, and on the back of that, we raised $143 million in December last year. Uh, and that, that put us into uh, you know, the equity component of the project funded. And recently on, on Monday, we just closed down our debt funding with, with Sprott. And so as of, of Monday, the, the project's now fully funded and, and you know, advancing into construction. When you took over, I think Mark was fairly excited. You're up around $1.30. You're a dollar less than that now. There's been a sort of steady decline or lack of interest in the story. I mean, what do you put that down to? Oh, look, I think there's there's probably a number of reasons. When Geo Pacific bought into Cooler, uh, I think obviously there was some, some long-suffering uh, Cooler Gold shareholders who'd, who'd seen quite a lot of money spent on the island. So I think initially uh, hopes were quite high given that the project was was permitted, uh, that, that it would quickly advance into into production. Um, and obviously that hasn't been the case. It's taken you know effectively another five years since, since Geo Pacific assumed full control of the asset for... For the, for the project to advance to the stage that it is. Uh, yeah, there's been a number of reasons for that. Uh, some of the environmental uh, work needed to be refreshed. Uh, there's been amendments to the mining permit. Uh, and Geo Pacific also undertook a substantial amount of additional drilling just to flesh out the resource because, you know, in, in retrospect, the feasibility study that, that Cooler undertook was, was probably a little bit underdone and it would have been difficult to fund in its, its present guise. So I think you know, the, the frustration that, that exists with the stock over that five-year window is just that, that everybody had heard the story. Everybody was aware that you know, there's phenomenal geology, there's, there's plenty of prospectivity on the island, but people just didn't want to fund another exploration plan. They really wanted to see the mine come into production. Right, okay. And now you've sort of talked about the money side of things. So last year you raised how much? $143 million we raised in December. So on the back of a, of a market cap of $80 million. So it was a... It was a fair effort. We've had some very good institutional support. Uh, we've had a number of our institutions back the company for, for quite a substantial period of time. 
um, and all of them fund, followed their money in that raise. So that was so. How did that break down? Was that all equity? Uh, that was yeah, equity of 143 million we raised. Wow, what was good effort? And um, you've just done a deal with Sprott. There's got a couple of components there. Can you break that down for me as well? Yeah, so in, in addition to the 143 million Australian in, in equity we raised, uh, Sprott's uh, providing 100 million US in, in debt. That debt is comprised of an $85 million uh, debt facility and a $15 million stream. The reason for the structuring along those lines was the fund that, that Sprott's funding us out of had a, had a cap of $85 million per investment. So the debt's fairly vanilla. Um, that's It's got a, a two-year capitalised interest and then a, a repayment period for 3.25 years thereafter. And the stream's a fairly standard stream. Uh, it funds immediately. And, and then we've got the opportunity to buy that out after 5.25 years when the debt is, is cleared. Okay, and, and there'll be conditions attached to that. What, what were they? Uh, so the funding order is we, we draw down, obviously, our equity in the stream first, and, and then the debt we're anticipating starting to draw that down late December, January this year. Um, the conditions fairly standard for, for a facility of this type. There's some production, sorry, construction milestones that we need to achieve. And then obviously cost to complete tests uh, as and when we draw down the debt next year. Right. And what was so what are the what's the loan at? What what are the terms? As in as a coupon on it, presumably as well. So uh yeah, so so the debt is LIBOR um in the first two years while capitalized, it's LIBOR plus seven point two five percent, dropping to LIBOR plus six point two five percent once we're uh servicing the debt. Uh in addition to that, Sprot has participation. So uh, they've got two and a half thousand ounces a month up to 100,000 ounces, uh, where they get the difference in the gold price between 1475 US and the prevailing gold price at the time. So effectively, 25% of our production in the early years is hedged at 1475 US with, with Sprock getting the benefit of, of the differential. Right. But so, you, but you're in construction now and you're looking to be in production by year end 2022. So you're fully funded. That's going to get built. No, no issues there. Um, all lo- long order lead time type stuff. All, it's all done, right? So no more coming to market. No. Okay. I'm so because I, I look at, I listen to those numbers and I'm looking at your market cap and going, the, there's a big disconnect here between what the market believes and what you are saying and, and the, your financial position at the moment. And so what, what is the feedback that you're getting? What are people concerned about? You must have institutional shareholders other than Sprott in here. I think you've got Tembo as well, haven't you? Who are, who are, you know, not too shabby. They're, they're pretty good reputation here in the UK for picking good, good projects. So where's the disconnect? Oh, look, so yes, certainly Tembo has been a long-term supporter. They've been with GF Pacific for, for many years, actually predate GF Pacific's involvement with, with the Woodlark project. Um, and similarly, Delphi has you know, been, been picking up quite a, a material stake in the company as well. So we have had very good institutional support, uh, both prior to the raise and, and subsequent to it. Uh, the, I think over the last six months in particular, the the concerns around the debt has certainly weighed on the share price. We did our raise at 42 cents. Uh, I think we closed today at just under 35 cents. Um, so people certainly were nervous that, that there was an issue with the debt. We indicated to the market previously that it would come out you know, in the earlier part of this quarter. Corralling lawyers in, in the US, Australia and, and multiple sets in PNG is is time consuming and incredibly difficult when you can't travel uh, as as none of us can at the moment uh, so so certainly that that gap between when we anticipated finalizing the debt and actually did finalize the debt I think that that caused a bit of nervousness in the market and that certainly saw us trade down into the low 30s um, but hopefully we we start to see some support now that people can see that the funding risk has, has disappeared certainly there's have never been any concerns about the quality of the resource. Uh, and, and the fact that the construction's progressing well on time, on budget, uh, we're, we're looking to, to see people starting to, to value for value the, the company for, for really what the assets were. Why didn't you go to a conventional debt provider? 
what you know, the Macquaries of this world sort of thing. Rice Sprott, because Sprott's kind of got a bit of a reputation for you know looking after themselves, but they're there and they can move quickly. So, but were you under pressure from the market to do this quickly? Was that what you're worried about? Uh, look, time was a factor, but but also I think people need to consider the reality of, of our situation. We're a single asset company uh, operating in PNG, which certainly in in the ASX context raises nervousness. Australians are quite parochial. Anything wet west of Perth and, and some would argue in the north of Sydney uh, raises some level of suspicion within the, the Australian markets. Uh, PNG, uh, people misunderstand it. I think, you know, it's it's sad that given Australia's long history with PNG, we, we don't really appreciate the country for, for what it's got to offer. Certainly when you look at, you know, the support that K92's had in the North American markets, it's it's... It's almost tragic that, that North America, you know, values PNG and, and sees the opportunities there better so than, than Australia, which is its nearest neighbour. Uh, and, and also uh, Australian financial institutions these days are, are very risk averse and, and very uh, conscious of developing in, in third world jurisdiction or developing country jurisdiction. So it's, it's, it was tough for us. And, and ultimately, when we ran the process, Sprott's terms were the most competitive. Um, but but, but, but competitive how? Like, the question is competitive because they were quick because banks take a long time to evaluate and, and diligence or competitive price wise that was a competitive set of terms was it financially I think that to a certain extent they're intertwined um, certainly the, the timeliness that, that Sprott could act in was compelling uh, but also on a purely economic basis Sprott's, Sprott's terms weren't materially different from from what we were looking at in, in other sources of, of, of capital. Why did you do the deal with Spot before the, the end of the financial year or tax loss season? For non-Aussies, that's a, it's effectively tax loss season, 30th of June. Why, why that time? Why not you know start conversations after that period? Because typically there's a little bump. Again, it come back to timing. Look, it was timing. We, we'd indicated to the market that we wanted to get the debt away at the beginning of the quarter. Uh, we worked you know exceedingly hard to, to get that away and, and for the last three months I've, I've been talking to you know all of our key investors and and the single message that's come through is where's the debt is there a problem with the debt and ultimately uh, we got to the position where we were ready to sign uh, we wanted to to get it done we wanted to put that behind us and you know unfortunately the timing just put us just before the end of the financial year uh, but uh, that being said you know it's only a couple of days later we're in the new year. Hopefully, the people who took some took some money off the table are looking to get back in. Certainly, the price is up twelve percent today, so it, it looks positive. Now we just need to continue that momentum. Okay, um, can we talk about Papua New Guinea? Because we've interviewed a few companies from there. Um, we like what we hear about the you know ease of doing business or the, the desire to you know encourage mining in country, etc. So, um, tell us a, bit, a little bit about where you are. Um, are you see you fully permitted? Yes, so we're fully permitted. We've got our environmental permits through till 2034, mining license through till 2034, uh, and then the compensation agreement is an open-ended agreement. So they're the three documents you need to mine in PNG. They're all, all squared away. So for us, it really is now just an ex- execution exercise. But you know, more broadly operating in PNG, I, I ran the Sindiri mine from 2013 through 2019. So plenty of time in country. Explain what that uh, means because not everyone's going to know what that means. So Sumbiri was the was owned by Sambara. They picked it up in the Allied Gold acquisition back in 2012. Uh, the project had obviously had a fairly troubled history until that, that point. Uh, the team we, we put together to, to turn Sumbiri around, in you know, 2013 it produced 45,000 ounces and uh, we produced 145,000 ounces in my last year on, on site. Uh, but more... More relevant to to Woodlark is is just the the relationships you form uh, operating in country. PNG is very much a relation driven uh, part of the world. I was fortunate in that in New Ireland, the the provincial governor for my time there was Sir Julius Chan, the ex prime minister. We had a phenomenal working relationship. Uh, traditionally, the mines minister is always a member of Sir Julius's party. Uh, so the current minister Johnson Tuke always worked very well with him. Uh, I joined, joined Geo Pacific October last year, and the support we've had from from the minister and, and the MRA, who's the regulator, in the sort of eight months I've been on board with the company now has been been phenomenal. 
the turnaround in terms of documentation and amendments and, and where we've needed documents to, to support the debt process. They've acted in a really timely manner and provided us with you know, everything you could reasonably ask for in terms of uh, bureaucratic and political support. Okay, so and again, I'm just trying to gather information because we're not spoken before. Um, remind me what the DFS uh, numbers were. What, what did it say? So the, the, the actual fundamentals of the project, uh, using a 2200 Australian dollar gold price, which is you know, relatively modest given the current environment, uh, the post-tax NPV is just under 350 million Australian uh, with an IRR of, of 34%. Uh, and more importantly for that part of the world, the, the payback is 1.8 years on the total capital. Uh, if you look at net cash on just on the debt, we're, we're net cash after about 14 months. So it's a really robust project, $255 million upfront capital, um, 10 years of mining with, with a subsequent three years of, of stockpile retreatment of treatment at the end. Uh, and certainly in our early years, we're, we're comfortably producing in excess of 100,000 ounces per annum. Life of mine, the all-in sustaining cost is, is 1239 Australian, uh, but there's certainly plenty of opportunity to improve on that, particularly when you look at the, the profile over the first five years when we've got the higher production. You see our, our costs are closer to sort of 1100 at that, that point in time. Right, okay. So it's a solid project. It's not huge at this stage, so I guess people want to understand what the, what the potential blue sky is here and how do you go about funding that? Because you know, on, on this t- ten years, you've got nice reserves in there. I guess you'll you are currently or will can, will be looking to bring that into a resource. Certainly. So we've currently got a one point six million ounce resource, uh, and within that, a one million ounce reserve. Uh, we've we've put money in the budget during the build. We'll have exploration rigs turning again uh, before the end of the year. Uh, the focus really is around our two main pits in the short to medium term. So Coolamadao and Busai Pit comprise about 90% of the resource. Uh, and due to the, the proximity of some of the community historically, Coolamadao, we haven't been able to drill out adequately just because people aren't real comfortable about you you're drilling in the schoolyard. Uh, so as part of the, the community relocation program, which will be, be finished in October, we'll finally be able to access Coolamadao in its entirety. So come November, we'll have a drill rig turning there. We know there's lateral extensions at surface, that we know there's mineralisation at surface, uh, which we just previously haven't been able to drill because of, of community. Um, so we're, we're very confident that in the period up until first gold pour, we can materially add to, to not only the resource for Kula Madau, but, but a, lot of, a lot more ounces in the reserves as well. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of how much cash are you allocating to that? And has that been set aside as part of the, the budget that you've now got? Yeah, so over the next 18 months, we've ring-fenced about $3 million Australian for, for that drill campaign, which, which in isolation seems like a fairly modest number. Um, but the way we've structured the drilling on the island is it's the same contract for doing our grey control production and exploration drilling. So all of their fixed costs are covered by our pre-production capital in the mine. Uh, the three million that's allocated to exploration is is purely down the hole dollars. So that three million will, will be down the hole plus assay costs, and we would expect that that'll that'll deliver us in the region of thirty five to forty thousand um, RC meters, which is quite a substantial amount of drilling over that period of time. Right. It's it yeah. It's, it's interesting. I mean, like I said, the, 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 there's this definite disconnect in the numbers when you're talking about getting into production at the end of next year at a hundred thousand. Answers. Yeah, just looking. At, if I did any simple peer analysis with you, there's there's a massive discount. And, and, and again, I'm just not quite sure where it's where it's coming from or, what, or why it's there. Are you? Is how much work have you done in terms of talking about the the scale potential here of this story? Because I think people are aware of of the growth opportunities. We've certainly highlighted it in, in all the marketing and all the discussions I've had with, with you know, retail and in, institu- institutional investors. Uh, but I think still the stigma of cooler to a certain extent and the people are just taking a wait and see approach. Uh, it's all good and well drilling the, the ore body out, but ultimately you need to monetize that. And that's what we'll be doing over the next 18 months is, is developing the project, building the plant. And I think once people see that the build is, is progressing smoothly, particularly as we get to sort of early next year and, and there's you know, quite a bit of uh, construction completed, I think we'll then start to see people 
value the the exploration upside that this project really has. Uh, you know, in its own right, if we didn't do any more drilling, it's it's still a very robust, simple little project. Uh, but you know, the the real upside here is the fact that we've got a mining lease that's grossly under underexplored. We've got tenements surrounding the mining lease in in all directions. We we've, we've probably got. Oh, I'd have to say, you know, close on 60% of the island is covered by tenements that we own. Uh, and they've, they've barely been touched historically. So there's a massive amount of land holding that, that we really need to give a good hard look at. And, you know, once, once we're drilling all of that, big part, once we're in production, any of those answers that we find will, will be through the mill and, and easily valued. So the, it seems quite a conservative approach to me, listening to this, and I hear a few stories each week. Um, is it because you're saying, because of the history, the legacy issues, we are going to want to sort of self-fund this going, but we can't afford to go back and dilute shareholders by asking for drill money? Is that it, or do you think you you will do that and say, well, actually, we, we do have ambition. We, we can scale quicker. Because waiting till the end of next year, goodness knows what's going to happen to the marketplace and people seem at the moment quite keen on discovery, exploration. That seems to be getting the attention of retail investors. Look, I think it's it's a good exploration story. And I, I think with the 40,000 metres that we've got budgeted, we'll be able to, to go a long way to demonstrating that. That being said, we've got uh, plenty of money sitting in, in reserve as well, which, which as we get closer to the end of the build, uh, will we'll certainly be uh, amenable to, to spending more on the exploration and really driving that, um, driving that home. As I said, for me, really focused on, on ultimately defining just how big Coolamadao and Bluside pits are. It's, it's, it's almost criminal, but you know now that I'm coming in at the end and, and on everyone's coattails, it, it's a great opportunity. It's not too many mines that go into production with their two main pits poorly defined, which is the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, we've got a great opportunity over the next 18 months to, to grow these pits. They're not constrained economically. They're not constrained by geology. Um, they're, they're just sitting there on, on the basis of a lack of drilling at depth and, and a long strike. So... That 40,000 metres is primarily targeted on just defining those two pits. Once that's done, we'll, we'll reassess and, and look at how much money we need to spend to really you know, look at all of the other, other opportunities on the mining lease. And, and there's at least a dozen uh, really good targets that we need to look at. We've got visible gold in the stream sediments all over the mining lease. Um, it's, you know, if this was... Uh, a lease in WA with similar characteristics that would have been poured over for the last 80 years. But in reality, it, it's barely been touched here. It's, it's really green fields. Uh, and if you look in the broader context of PNG, I think the next smallest res you know, resource is, is nearly, well, I, I can't quote what K92 is at the moment. I know they're growing very quickly. But, you know, Simbiri was a 5 million ounce resource. So at 1.6 million you know, conservatively, you've got to think that we're we're closer to three to five million ultimately. And you know, I was at, at Tazius previously, and all it takes is one drill hole, and, and suddenly everything changes. So it's you know, I'm not sure if lightning strikes twice, but I, I wouldn't wouldn't complain if it did. So why did they bring you in? I, I, I get this a very um, you know in country experience is really good, but in terms of the actual operations, what were the problems that you were brought in to solve specifically? I think, again, as the, the perception of Geo Pacific was that it was an exploration play and people had concerns about the quality of, well, not so much the quality of team, but certainly the composition of the team as a transition from an exploration play into, into an execution uh, exercise. Obviously, my background in, in PNG for the last six years demonstrated success at Sambiri. We, we turned that from a, a $2,500 ounce, you know, 2500 dollar an ounce producer down to a 700 dollar an ounce producer and, and sustained that for, for many years um, had the runs on the board understood the jurisdiction and you know I've been through you know, project developments and, and extensions and, and expansions and the like so you know jurisdictionally though PNGs is quite unique um, I guess every every jurisdiction is unique, but you know PNG again, as I said earlier, is very much driven by relationships, and it's it's not an easy place to come into and hit the ground running. Uh, so certainly that was a big part of the reason I was brought in. Uh, and 
you know, essentially investors wanted to see someone with an operational background at the helm of the company. Okay, yeah, let, let's, let's talk about PNG because it is kind of quite a special place uh, in, in many ways. Um, the, you've relocated a lot of houses and you know and and a, and a, a small community there. Companies like to talk the language of CSR, ESG, good citizen, all the rest of it. What are you guys doing? Meaningful stuff. PNG is actually a really easy country to to manage your ESG in. Uh, the nature of the place is that, that the landowners in Papua New Guinea have uh, a phenomenal amount of sway in the success of an operation and, and at a political level. So if you don't manage your ESG, you get shut down immediately. And that shutdown is not driven from a, a top down with the, the government. It's it's from bottom up by, by your stakeholders. So it, it means that you get very, very rapid feedback on, on how you're performing from an ESG perspective. So you know, our approach at the moment fairly modest, can measure it with, with our funding and, and the stage of the project we're in. But certainly the, the village relocation, it's not just moving houses. Uh, we've been building a school. We've been building uh, clinics across the island. We've since rolled out since my arrival. We've, we've hired local doctors who work at our clinic. We provide free medical to all community members on the island. Um, obviously, there's the usual support in terms of sponsoring students and the like. Uh, but at this stage, our, our primary focus is on developing the project, employing local people, reinvesting in, in health and training and, and education on the island. And then also, we, you know, we've committed 3 million Kina over the next 18 months to, to, to business development initiatives, helping you know, locals from the island develop their companies, getting, getting the constitution set up, giving them seed capital so they can participate in, in the mine, not only as an employee, but also as a, as a small business owner and, and ideally grow their business as the project progresses. So you came in in October, looking back, what, what could you have done differently? Because, you know, you presided over a pretty sharp fall in the, in the share prices. Is, is it just a lull before, well, during construction phase or was it market or was it something that decisions that you made which you shouldn't have? What do you put it down to? Uh, look, certainly, I mean, I joined in October on the back of, of a pretty big increase in the gold price and, and the entire gold sector on the ASX had a, enjoyed a good run. Uh, hindsight, it would have been phenomenal to try and get the raise away in November rather than December. Uh, but, you know, that that timing had sort of been dictated by events prior to my arrival. It would have been nice to, to get the raise away at, you know, 50 or 60 cents rather than 42. Uh, but then again, gold fell away a lot. January, February, and the broader sentiment in the market, you know, dropped. If you look at, I guess, market stalwarts like Northern Star or Evolution, you know, they, they're down from 17 down to $10. So the fall has been, uh, I guess, not necessarily linked to our performance. It's, it's a broader market performance. Uh, and, you know, in hindsight, I don't think we could have done too much differently. 2020, yes, I would have loved to have got the raise away in November with, with the benefit of the strong gold movement at the time. But conversely, if it had delayed to January, February, it would have been a hell of a lot harder to get the raise away. So now on balance, I think we're just a little bit of a victim of circumstances. Um, and I guess the other part would have been you know, trying to get the debt away a couple of months earlier than rather than three days before the end of the financial year in Australia when everybody was uh, looking to crystallise some tax losses in advance of, uh, of the end of the financial year. So I think that the real judge on how people interpret that uh, the, the funding and the de-risking of the project will be over the next couple of weeks. We're in the new financial year. People have had a chance to digest what it means for the project. Uh, the, the tax tax selling's finished. Uh, and I'd like to think people will start to really look at the projects on its merits again, uh, take away the fact that uh, the concerns around funding, they're addressed. They'll have seen the releases we've been putting out to the market over the last quarter in terms of ordering of the mills, ordering of the power station, ordering of the mining fleet. You know, they'll see that we're committed, see that all the, the long lead items are being ordered. Uh, and then, you know, coming up with the, with the quarterlies when we demonstrate that we're on budget on time and coupled with, with some good expiration news starting to come out in the December quarter. You know, hopefully we start to get some momentum again as we lead into, into the production next year.